my privilege to speak to you today uh, in the absence of our pastor. The title of my message, The Everlasting Father, since it is indeed Father's Day. And my focus of the message is to the fathers and men that are present, but my message also does fit the ladies and young people that are here as well. For all of us need to serve our living Lord. <clears throat> now the scripture we read today, chapter 9, of course needs to be seen in context. And the context was that Isaiah was predicting the impending fall of Israel, the northern kingdom, Samaria as it were, um, although it was not Samaria at that time, but its capital was Samaria. Um, the impending fall of this northern kingdom to the Assyrians. So Isaiah chapter 7 and 8 talked about that. And we see in verse 1 that it, it mentions a specific region of the northern kingdom. The, the area that was under the direction, under the control of the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali. And that's the region that was around the Sea of Galilee. It was the area that was inherited um, by these tribes, given to them by the Lord. And it's also the very first area to fall to the Assyrians, the first area that the Assyrian Empire conquered. By the way, there's two groups that are kind of confusing. And if you read, if you go and read these chapters, you're going to see Syria and Assyria. Syria still exists today. It's north and northeast of Israel. Still an enemy of Israel. Assyria was in the land that is now occupied by Iraq and parts of Turkey. So this was the first area to fall to the Assyrian Empire. It was also the area where our Lord Jesus grew up. And in fulfillment of these first couple of verses, verse 2, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. That was fulfilled in part when Jesus began his earthly ministry right there in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. So verses 1 and 2 portray a land of gloom and darkness. God was warning his people that judgment was coming and that the enemies, their, their enemies, the Assyrians, would indeed be bringing death, destruction, false religion, decadence. Well, they were pagan. They knew not God. They did not worship him. They did not care to worship him. We could well say that the Assyrian Empire were the first terrorists in history. And we know that region is still known for terrorism. Indeed, the land that was supposed to be holy, set apart by God for his people to serve and love him, had been plunged into darkness and despair. Why? Because the Assyrians came and conquered them? No. That was the result. The reason was because of Israel's unbelief, Israel's refusal, God's people refusal, God's physical people, their refusal to listen to and obey God. It's a warning for our nation, is it not? Our nation was once in great light. Our nation is still reaping the blessing of light. But our nation is growing gradually darker, more decadent, calling that which is evil good and that which is good evil. If God punished his own people, what would he do to our nation? The good news is that God did not abandon his people forever. The darkness was broken. The gloom was dispelled. The people walking in darkness, people living their lives in darkness. Are there people about us living in darkness? Sure are. Anyone who does not have the light of Christ within them 
is living in darkness, whether they know it or not. The people living in darkness saw a great light. People in our nation have seen, they know about Jesus. They know he's the Savior. It doesn't mean they've trusted him. And we each trusted Jesus as Savior and Lord. The people walking in darkness saw a great light. It was the region of, in which, in Galilee, that that light first shined. The darkness ushered in by the unbelief of the people and by the Assyrian Empire was sent by God to deal with that unbelief. Yet there was hope. There is hope for us, for our nation. Jesus is the light of the world. Think back. For thousands of years, for millennia, our land, this continent, was in spiritual darkness. There was no light. The light was first brought to this land by our forefathers, and we've inherited the blessings due to their devotion to that light. It seems as if the light of America is dimming. We, we need to look about us. We need to understand that our land is becoming increasingly pagan, increasingly apostate. We live in a land where everything is to be tolerated except the light of God's truth. Like Israel, you know, in Isaiah's time, Israel was still greatly blessed. We're experiencing, but they were also experiencing the Lord's chastisement. We're experiencing the same, I believe, in our nation. Our nation's reaping what it's sown. For too many decades, too many parents, I'm not saying here, but in our society, too many parents, and especially fathers, have abdicated the authority that God has given them. Fathers, grandfathers, especially they, fathers, but teachers, parents, those in authority, are we by our words and by our example portraying God's light? One of our Puritan forefathers, John Flavel, has said this about the responsibility of parents and especially fathers. Quote, If you neglect to instruct them in the way of holiness, will the devil neglect to instruct them in the way of wickedness? No. If you will not teach them to pray, he will to curse, swear, and lie. If the ground be uncultivated, weeds will spring. Many of the children in our nation, generations of the children in our nation, have been left as uncultivated ground for the world, the flesh, and the devil. Christians, let us cry out to God in repentance, asking that he will hear from heaven, forgive our sins, and therefore heal our land. On this Father's Day, let's consider the character traits of our everlasting Father. If we look at verses 6 and 7, we see a description of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we see that he is indeed called the everlasting Father. I'll get into that more in a bit, but let's look at the characteristics of our everlasting Father, our Lord Jesus. These characteristics should be present in all of us, both men and women, boys and girls, but to fathers, especially. Fathers, leaders, are you presenting Christ? One day Christ will return and once and for all bring his land and his people into the light and the liberty of the gospel. The prophecies found in this passage were partially fulfilled by the increase of the nation of Israel after they returned to the land following the Babylonian captivity. It was further spread by the victories of the Maccabees. He was enlightened even more when Jesus first came. But the ultimate fulfillment of this passage is waiting for Jesus' second coming and his millennial reign. That's what's portrayed here. The word portrait begins in verses 6 and 7. Let's take a look. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, 
Now, when Jesus came the first time, did he, did he receive the government? No, he did not. Now, they tried to force him to be king. Hosanna! They laid their coats before them, spread palm leaves. They were coronating him king, but it was not time for him to be king at that time, other than king of their and our hearts. Jesus will return. He will reign. He will reign with a rod of iron. He will come back in judgment to bring justice to the land. So let's look at this passage. For unto us a child is born. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus is and was at that moment fully human. He was born for the benefit of us sinners, for all believers who from the beginning of the world until the end of the world. In Isaiah 7.14, we see his virgin birth. Let's take a look at it. Turn back just a page or two. Isaiah 7.14 Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel. That means God with us. Beloved, if we have accepted Christ as our Savior, God is indeed with us all the time. You know, the Psalms talk all, often about, oh, I want to be at the holy hill. I want to be in Zion. Why? Because that's where God was. They don't, didn't have the privilege that we have. God with us. Indeed, God is indeed, Jesus is indeed Emmanuel. He's with us this moment. For unto us a child is born. Jesus, fully human. He's able to understand our every need. Anything we've experienced, he's experienced too. Yet without sin. Unto us a child is born. Next we see his deity. Unto us a son is given. Unto us a son is given. A son is given, not born. Jesus is the only begotten of the Father. This points to Jesus' deity. Jesus is fully human. Jesus is fully God. He's both. He's the only begotten of the Father. And when we look at verse 6, we see, we see a description of his government, his kingdom. His reign, his government is seen to be prosperous, peaceful, Davidic, he's inherited the throne of David, righteous, eternal, and certain. This will happen. Jesus will come back. Jesus will reign. Every knee shall bow to Lord Jesus. Some too late. Some involuntarily. But they will bow. Then we see some of Jesus' names listed. Now remember, I've taught this before, that the names of God are not merely identifiers. Hey, my name's Keith. What's that tell you? In and of itself, nothing. Now if you know me, when you hear the name Keith, you probably think various things. Hopefully good. <laughs> probably don't want to know. But, in and of itself, Keith tells you nothing. You might be able to figure out, well, Keith's an English name. Maybe, he's, maybe his ancestors are from England. Eh, nice try. Not so. But, <clears throat> God's names, Jesus' names, are more than merely identifiers. They're just scriptors. They tell us about him. So look at these names. Wonderful. Counselor. Now, it could be that those names, by the way, are supposed to go together, that, that there shouldn't be a comma there, because all the rest of the names have two words or more. The Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Could be Wonderful Counselor. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But he is wonderful. He is a counselor. He's someone who gives sage advice. He's someone who teaches us. He's the mighty God. 
And notice this one. This one is kind of would strike us as unusual. He's the everlasting father. He's the prince of peace. I'd like to examine these names, especially in the context of one of these descriptive names, the everlasting father. The everlasting father shows us who God the father is and what he's like. Jesus said that no man has seen the father, but if that you look at Jesus, if you see Jesus in his character, you've seen the father. All of us, and especially earthly fathers, should seek to be like Jesus and therefore like God the Father. Jesus, the everlasting Father, points us to God the Father. Fathers, are your lives leaders? Are our lives pointing others, especially our wives and our children, our grandchildren, our students? Are we pointing them to the Father? Let's take some time and examine these names. Wonderful. Now, I have homework for you. I have an assignment. Sometime this week, I'd like you to, to go into God's Word and read God's description of Himself. Go to the book of Job and read chapters 38 and 39 and the first two verses of chapter 40. He lists His qualities. He lists what He's like. Then turn in Isaiah to chapter 40. Read the description there as well. If you're, when you finish reading those sections of God's Word, of how God describes Himself, you should have a sense of wonder. You should have a sense of awe. There are other ways in which God is wonderful, in which our Lord Jesus is wonderful, should fill us with wonder. How could this be? How could this be? How could Jesus, who's perfect and holy, Love us enough to die for us who were his enemies. Who, given the chance, would have driven nails right into his hands. Would have poked that spear into his side. Would have inflicted pain. And he loved us and died for us. That should give us a sense of wonder. It makes the angels wonder. The angels look at our redemption and our filled with awe and curiosity. How can this be? Remember, angels are either forever good or if they fell, forever fallen. God did not send Jesus to die for Lucifer who became the devil. They're without redemption. They look at us and they look at God and they're filled with wonder. Are we filled with awe of our Lord Jesus Christ? Are we, fathers, are we expressing that to our children? Are we teaching that to them? Teachers, the same. Mothers and daughters, the same as well. He died that we might live. He lives that we might live with him and for him. Fathers, Jesus said, "No love, no, no one has a greater love than if he dies for his friends." Jesus died for us. He showed agape love. Are we modeling that love? Selfless love, putting the needs of others ahead of our own. Ladies, you know that you've been commanded to obey your husband. When I was a teacher, guys would yeah, go obey me. They forgot the next part. What causes a lady to want to obey her mate? It's because her mate loves her as Christ loves the church. We have some young ladies in the room. If you find a man who loves you like Christ loves the church, grab him. Don't let him get away. He's a keeper. We're told to find virtuous women on Mother's Day. Ladies are told to live as virtuous women on Mother's Day. Men, 
Are we exhibiting agape love? It'll cause people to wonder. It'll cause people to find that Jesus is wonderful. Counselor. Dads are supposed to give sage, unemotional advice, aren't they? Our children, at least at first, think Daddy knows everything. Daddy can fix anything. Daddy can do it all. Physical and spiritual fathers should exhibit wisdom, just as our everlasting Father does. Let's turn, if you would please, to Proverbs chapter 8. In the book of Proverbs, wisdom is personified. And of course, who actually is this person? Well, it's our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the description of wisdom. It could only be He. It could only be God. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22 and 23. The Lord possessed me. That's Jehovah. That's Yahweh. Who did Jesus say? What did Jesus do to cause the Pharisees to want to stone him? Before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, Jehovah. Jesus claims to be this capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The Lord, Jesus, possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from, this is wisdom speaking, I was set up from everlasting from the beginning wherever the earth was. Well, how could that be? How could wisdom exist before the earth was even created? Well, it's because it's Jesus himself. Jesus is the source of all our wisdom. Our everlasting Father is the source of wisdom. He gives wholesome direction. The living word does this through the work of the Spirit, through his written word. Fathers and leaders, are we giving godly counsel? Mothers, are we doing the same? Teachers, are we doing the same? Every moment, every occurrence in our lives is under his control and within, within his plan. Fathers, leaders, mothers, teachers, we need to guide our children even when they don't like it. You know, God's people rejected his guidance to their great regret. regret. Lost the land, thrown into captivity. But even that was in his plan. Young people, sometimes your parents or your teachers, others that are in authority, are going to guide you in a way that you don't like. If it's godly, Listen to their counsel. You know, I, I can remember there were times when my parents would not let me do something. I thought I was going to die. I'm still alive. We need to listen to those in authority over, to, over us if that authority is godly. We need to listen to our God even if we don't like what he has to say. I mentioned in Sunday school. We're to walk the narrow path. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Well, then why, if we know that, then why do we want to go the broad way that leads to destruction? Because sin is pleasant. I used this illustration in Sunday school. It would be sinful for me to take a hammer and hit myself in the head repeatedly. I'm extremely unlikely to do that. Why? Because it would hurt. It would be unpleasant. I'd see no purpose in it. Sin is deceitful. It seems pleasant at the time. It leads to our destruction. We need to listen to our Lord. Sometimes bad things are going to happen in our lives. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. Pretty familiar passage probably. 
Well, let's think about the context. Well, we'll read the verse and then we'll think about, think about the context. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. <clears throat> this is God speaking. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. This is Jehovah. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now think about the context here. What has Jeremiah been doing in the previous 28 chapters? Telling people who don't want to hear it, the Babylonians are going to conquer you. If you fight them, it's going to be worse. Because the Lord is not going to protect you. The Lord is not going to grant you victory over the Babylonians. Your sins have caught up to you. You're going to be conquered. It can happen two ways. Death and great death and destruction or less. Not a very pleasant message. And yet, what does God say here? In that context, I know the thoughts I have towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. Thoughts of peace in the long run, peace with God, peace from God for eternity, that I might give you an expected end, hope later. You're going to go through a trial right now. It's not going to be pleasant. You have a choice. It could be unpleasant or really bad. Well, we may face that in our nation someday. We need to remember our God is our counselor. He's our guide. And his thoughts towards us are always good thoughts. He has an expected end. He has a purpose in it. He's the mighty God. Our everlasting Father is a warrior. And he's a compassionate protector of his people. Families look towards fathers for protection, don't they? That's part of the job. As an elder, it's part of my job. I'm supposed to be protecting the flock, warning the flock, advising the flock. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 10. God cares about people that are weak. God cares about people that are helpless. God cares about people in general. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. For the Lord, that's Jehovah, your God, Elohim, in the beginning Elohim created the heavens and the earth. For the Lord your God is God of gods, Lord of lords, a great God and mighty. That's Jesus. There's no God higher than Jesus. No, Jesus is going to be called King of kings and Lord of lords. A mighty and a terrible, awesome, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. Fathers, leaders, mothers, are we teaching our young people not to regard people in their positions, but rather their need? Are we looking at people and saying, oh, I don't want any parts of him, look at him, instead of seeing their need? That's a hard one for us, isn't it? We need to show compassion. We need to teach compassion. Our God is not only mighty in that way, but he's also a warrior. He's also a means of protection. Turn to Psalm 46, verse 1. A passage you probably have memorized. Psalm 46, verse 1. <clears throat> God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Very present. Always present. Ever present. God is our refuge and strength. Remember, we're in at war. We're at war with the world, the flesh, and the devil. Soldiers sometimes kind of get tired and beat up. God is the place that we can turn to. God is the place that we can run to. 
The Psalms talk of God being our strong tower. God's people can run to the strong tower and be safe. But that's not where we're supposed to stay. Dads, are you your family's strong tower? That bulwark of strength on which they can depend Yet, we have to teach them not only to depend on you, but to depend on God and get back out there in the battle. Jesus is a warrior. He tells us in the book of Ephesians that we're to do what? We're to put on our on the whole armor of God. What do we need armor for if we're not at war? Why do we need a breastplate of righteousness and a helmet of salvation and a belt of truth? Our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Why do we need all those things if we're not at war? We have an adversary who's seeking to destroy us. Seeking to destroy our young people. Seeking to destroy our older people. Seeking to destroy this body of believers. Fathers, are we teaching our young people to put on the whole armor of God each day? Are we putting it on ourselves? Everlasting Father. Now please don't misunderstand me and what I've said. I've tried to make it clear. Jesus and God the Father are indeed distinct persons of the Godhead. Yet Jesus tells us that He and the Father are one. One in character. One in purpose. Two purpose. Two purpose. Two persons. One purpose. Jesus reveals the Father to us. Jesus is our everlasting Father because He reveals God to us. Are we doing that? Are we revealing God to others? Turn back a bit to, in Isaiah to, to verse 18. Isaiah 8, 18. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Fathers, are you making your children a sign to others? Are you teaching them to share Jesus? Moms, the same thing. Bible school teachers, the same thing. In Hebrews chapter 2, the writer quotes this and some other passages that show that Jesus and his children, that's us, do the same. Our everlasting Father has children. It's us. He gave wonderful counsel. Look unto me and be saved. He gives wonderful counsel. Jesus tells us that he is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus said that before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is saying, I'm God. I've existed forever. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's beyond time. He created time. Jesus made all things by the word of his power. Jesus is indeed the everlasting Father because He's the Father of everlasting life. In ancient times, kings often claimed to be the father of their subjects. Our everlasting Father is, is, is indeed such because He takes care of His children. I told you before to turn that you know I gave you a homework assignment. Part of that was to read Isaiah chapter 40. Well, guess what? I'm going to help you do part of your assignment right now. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40, and we're going to look at verses 9 through 11. Isaiah 40, 9 through 11. O Zion, the place that God dwelt. O Zion, and the word Jesus will dwell again. O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bearest good tidings, Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, 
Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand and His arm shall rule for Him. That's not His first coming, is it? His arm shall rule for Him. Behold, His reward is with Him. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a reward. It's coming. It's sure. A reward is with Him and His work before Him. The ungodly have a reward coming too. They're not going to like it. But what is he going to do for us? Verse 11, He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. What did Jesus say? I am the great shepherd. I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. This is our God. This is our everlasting Father. This is our Lord Jesus. In Matthew 8, 18, verses 12 through 14, Jesus seeks out and preserves not only his church, but in this parable, he says, a shepherd has a hundred sheep, 99 are safe, and one has gone astray. What does the shepherd do? He leaves the 99 sheep and goes and finds the one. God cares about us. The Lord Jesus, the everlasting Father, cares about us as individuals. We need to care about people, just as Jesus does, just as our everlasting Father does. He seeks out and preserves not only our church, not only the all believers, but each individual as well. Turn, if you would, to please, to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23. Verses 9 through 12. Here's a warning to fathers, a warning to leaders. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Fathers, leaders, everyone. What does God want of us? He wants us to walk humbly before him. Are we showing the humility of Christ to our families, to our family? He expects us to not be petty dictators. Psalm 103.13 says, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Are we teaching humility? Are we walking in humility? Are we compassionate? As we lead and teach, as we work and play, fathers, leaders, mothers, young people, do we esteem others better than ourselves? Fathers, we teach our children to fear the Lord, which is indeed the beginning of wisdom, as we lead them and expect obedience, let's do so with kindness and humility. Lest we provoke them to wrath rather than teaching them the admonition of the Lord. Let's show the compassion of our everlasting Father who, knowing that we are dust, pitieth, pities us. Our everlasting Father is also the Prince of Peace. He eliminated the enmity, the warfare between us and God. For those who love and fear him, as I mentioned before, he enables us to call him Abba, Daddy. Not merely, oh, he's the father, he made me, I have to obey him. No, he's my daddy. I obey him because I love him. He's our everlasting father. Unlike the Roman pater, young people, you would not want to live in a Roman household. Did you know that if you disobeyed a Roman father, he could kill you? It would not be a crime. It's the love of Christ who taught fathers to love their children. Our everlasting father invites us to love him and to love others. A 
An 18th century teacher and writer, commentator, Matthew Henry aptly sums up the passage thusly. The child is born, it was certain, and the church before Christ came in the flesh benefited by his undertaking. It is a prophecy of him and of his kingdom, which thou, those that waited for the consolation of Israel read with pleasure. This child was born for the benefit of us men, of us sinners, and of all believers from the beginning to the end of the world. Justly is called wonderful, for he is both God and man. He is, his love is a wonder of the angels and glorified saints. He is counselor, for he knows the counsel of God from eternity. He gives counsel to men. He is a wonderful counselor. None teacheth like him. He is God, the mighty one. Such is the work of the mediator. No less power than that of the mighty God could bring it to pass. He is God, one, one with the Father, a prince of peace. He reconciles us to God. The government shall be upon him. He shall bear the burden of it. Glorious things are spoken of Christ's government. There is no end to the increase of its peace, for the happiness of its subjects shall last forever. The exact agreement of this prophecy with the doctrine of the New Testament shows the Jewish prophets and Christian teachers had the same view of the person and salvation of the Messiah. To what earthly king or kingdom can these words apply? Give then, O Lord, to thy people to know thee by every endearing name and in every glorious character. Give increase of grace in every heart of thy redeemed upon the earth. Let's pray together. Father, we thank thee for your goodness, your 